Okay, um, so first of all, good morning. Buenos dias, bom dia. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. What uh, we really hope and expect to be a very engaging, stimulating conversation about sustainable mobility, uh, pedestrian friendly and, and carbon free cities. Um, so uh, I'm Robert Severo. I'm a professor from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, I'm delighted to chair uh, this morning's session. I uh, want to thank the sponsors for the kind invitation to be here. Barcelona is a wonderful city to be in and visit. Um, but I particularly want to thank you for coming, uh, particularly uh, to brave the elements outside. It's kind of a nasty morning, and I uh, might have cut a little into our audience, but uh, the people that really are passionate about this subject are here. So thank you for coming. Um, we have a little bit of a change in our schedule. Uh, one or two of our speakers are not able to make it. Uh, so on the one hand, that kind of throws things off. But on the other hand, it gives us more time. Uh, I find these gatherings, a lot is compressed within a very limited time, and we're uh, very much trying to get through our materials quickly. I think this gives us a little more leisurely pace to have a, a, a more in-depth conversation and hopefully uh, open things up for your um, questions and, and, and discussions with, with the broader audience. So um, the, 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 the core question that this panel and this session was asked to address was how can we travel more while emitting less? And, and I think we recognize uh, that's, that's a dilemma we've been wrestling with for the last 15, 20 years. There's an increasing demand for mobility uh, and when I think of mobility, I think mainly of social economic interaction. Mobility is a positive thing. We want people to interact socially and economically and, and the progress and productivity gains that come from that. But at the same time, as we're increasingly reliant on motorized forms of transportation, uh, the carbon climate change consequences of, of those actions uh, become into question. Um, the topic we're addressing here Sustainable mobility is a vast landscape, and what I'm really hoping we can do is zero in on um, the subtitle, which is pedestrian-friendly cities and zero-carbon cities. Um, so in terms of pedestrian-friendly cities, uh, I think we all recognize walking is nature's transportation mode. It's the cleanest, greenest form of mobility, uh, and it has the benefit of creating healthier citizens. If we encourage people to take more and more steps or pedal more and more on their bicycles every day, there's a lot of important public health benefits. And some social scientists even argue that cities where people walk more, there's more today day-to-day -day social interaction. You build social capital. People have a little more empathy and understanding for people that are different than them, have different opportunities. So. It, um, this notion of, of really creating a, a great interactive, socially engaging city, I think, is critically linked to pedestrian friendly designs. Um, with that said, uh, there's a number of trends, uh, technological trends, disruptive trends, trends, mega trends, that really threaten the walkability and pedestrian friendliness of cities. Um, you know, the Autonomous vehicle revolution, connected vehicles. Um, well, on the one hand, we hope that would reduce accidents with pedestrians. But the, on the other hand, we saw earlier this year with Uber self-driving cars in Tempe, Arizona, uh, there was a fatality between a pedestrian and a self-driving car. Um, so if something goes awry with this technology, um, pedestrians are, are the most exposed, the most vulnerable. Uh, and some people would even argue as cities adjust themselves to very efficient forms of mobility, uh, autonomous connected vehicles that you can uh, put vehicles closer and closer together and, and uh, have more efficiency and faster speeds. The city is going to adjust. It's going to become more spread out. And as a consequence, uh, it's going to be less walkable. Distances are going to become further and further uh, apart, and it makes for less of a walkable, bikeable city, potentially. Or electric vehicles. Um, they're quite, you know, they're, they're wonderful, potentially uh, carbon-free form of, of propulsion and mobility, but they're also quiet. Uh, and sometimes, particularly as we have aging societies where people have difficulty hearing, they don't hear electric vehicles as, as well as motorized vehicles. 
And in just even the aging process where um, we have an explosion of electric scooters and e-bikes really congregating on the spaces of pedestrians uh, and, and uh, encroaching on the public realm, that begins to create critical safety concerns for pedestrians. So on the one hand, I think we all recognize the cleanest, greenest, healthiest form of mobility is walking, but in many ways it's a form of mobility which is most subject to disruption and potentially threatened by some of the revolutionary changes we're, we're um, enduring, particularly again as we have aging societies, which, which is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, one point, th we, we really have a global pandemic problem in terms of pedestrian fatalities. 1.3 million people every year die on roads, and 28% of those are pedestrians and cyclists. But if you go to the global south, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, parts of Africa, you find 70, 80% of fatalities on roads are pedestrians. So, and these are the very places where according to UN United Nations, 80 to 90% of our urban population growth will take place in the low income, uh, lower middle income cities of the global south. So the very environments where pedestrians are most uh, vulnerable and have the highest fatality rates are the very places where most of our urban population growth is happening. Um, in our quest to create zero carbon cities and, and stabilize climates, uh, it's absolutely unavoidable that the transport sector must play a very prominent role. We all know the statistics, 24 to 25% of energy-related um, greenhouse gas emissions come from the transport sector. In terms of carbon dioxide emissions from, um, uh, from fuel consumption, the fastest growing sector is the transport sector. In some parts of the developing world, 40 to 50% of greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide emissions uh, come from the transport sector. Uh, with that said, I think it's clear if we're to create truly carbon-free cities, if we're to vastly decarbonize our cities, um, electrification of our vehicle fleets is critically important. But the question becomes, where does that electricity come from? If much of our plug-in hybrid technology is being, the electricity is being generated from coal-fired power plants, that's going to do very little to, to reduce um, emissions of carbon in, in, into the environment. Um, there's a lot we can obviously do beyond the technical supply side as it relates to reducing uh, carbon emissions in our cities. There's a lot through land use management. We can design cities where the distances are shorter through compact mixed use development, transit oriented development. Or we, we could use smart technology to have smarter pricing, to really pass on higher price signals to motorists. So all of them are part of the toolkit, if you will, of strategies we can begin to introduce to um, truly create carbon, uh, zero, zero carbon cities of the future. So um, I, I think nothing short of transformative change is going to be necessary if we are indeed by 2050 to create zero carbon cities, uh, radical change in our technology, radical changes in the urban milieus and the environments that we create for cyclists and, and, um, and pedestrians, and indeed trying to create places which are much more inviting and welcoming uh, to non-motorized travelers. Um, so before um, we, we now turn to our, our morning speaker, um, let me just get a little bit of audience engagement here. Um, let me just ask a show of hands, uh, on a typical weekday, uh, how many of you get to work where the predominant mode of transportation is active transport? And what I mean by active transport is walking, uh, bicycling, pedal cycling, or, or any form of mobility where you're really burning calories significantly, skateboard, uh, rollerblade, anything like that. So how many of you... Okay, that, that's a good number. Um, it looks like about a quarter of you. Okay, so a quarter of you are, about, are active um, commuters. A and that's much higher than uh, what we find in most metropolitan areas. How many of you take uh, personal mobility devices? Electric scooters, electric bikes, uh, segways, hoverboards, any of that stuff? So any, any show of hands? Okay, a few. 
So you're, you're, you're doing good for the most part, though you're not burning the calories. So you're, you don't quite stand up the uh, sustainability pyramid like the, uh, the true active commuters. And then how many of you are taking public transport to, to work typically? Okay, my, my count is about two-thirds of you are green commuters. Uh, you're, you're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution. In fact, if we could get the rest of planet Earth to behave like you, m many of our problems would, would be eliminated. Uh, so yeah, that's pr pretty much your challenge. How do we design environments, create incentives, transportation options, where we get more people to behave like you folks in the audience here? Um, okay, so um, with that, uh, I, I do have to announce, first of all, that I believe our scheduled keynote, thematic keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Edion uh, Villiage, is not here in attendance. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, he is coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're we're ad-libbing here. I was told he's not coming. Now I'm told he is. So that, that changes things around. But he's not here yet. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're going to flip. Uh, the schedule a bit, and we're going to now move to our uh, thematic dialogue session. And uh, we're, we're very pleased here uh, in our thematic dialogue section to have Mr. Al Alvaro uh, Nicolos, who is an advisor to the mobility counselor of the Barcelona City Council, where I think for the last 15 or 20 years, he's, he's actively worked as a consultant and a technical advisor in many aspects of sustainable mobility principally here in Barcelona, but I believe also in London and other parts of the world. So um, I, I, the way we'll do this is, is Mr. Nicolas will give a brief presentation, and then we're going to have a bit of a, a conversation amongst ourselves, and then we'll see if there's questions from the audience. So with that, if you would please join me in welcoming Mr. Alvaro Nicolas. So. Should I? OK. Uh, I was coming for a <laughs> for a, for a dialogue session. I didn't have any any presentation, so I'm just gonna explain a little bit what we have been working in the last um, during the last year here in Barcelona, but also touching on some of the aspects that uh, here Robert was uh, already highlighting, which I think that are part of a very interesting debate and that have to analyze in the future whether if the, somehow the public transport solutions, which are the, the collective solutions for transport, are, are the ones that are going to be moving our cities in the future, or if, there, if it's going to be a, a, a scenario in which the individualized modes of transport, like um, well, maybe not cars, something smaller, with, uh, that are going to be the ones that are going to be taken around uh, us in cities. I think, uh, well, it's probably it's going to be a combination of, of, of both, as, as we see now in cities. And also, uh, what, I, what I'm very concerned is that we still, even though uh, we are um, much trying for many years uh, to somehow uh, work from, uh, from distance from the, our workplace, and also if we're trying to um, um, organize our time schedule in different ways, there's a still a peak time in every city, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, uh, uh, there's a, where millions of, of, of people have to get to their workplace, and that's uh, that very situation that, it, that it's ex extending, and that it, uh, we also have one in the, in the afternoon. It's very, very difficult that we manage to sort that out with um, individualized modes of transport. So at the end, uh, the, the, ma the massive modes of transport, like, um, um, of course, buses and, and, the, and the underground and so on, are the ones that are helping and making room for the rest of mobility. I mean, in Barcelona, 39% um, of, of our trips are done by, by public transport. During the day, uh, around uh, 31 are made by, by foot. And that is this uh, around... Um, 70% of the of, of the of the modes of transport of the of the trips that are done by this sustainable means of transport are the are the ones that are making room for the other mobility to happen. So what we are really trying in Barcelona, it's it's uh, of course making a dramatic change on that would be very very difficult. But of course, the setting the, the all the all what it's necessary to make a a, a shift on this uh, on this. Uh, on this, um, on this model split uh, year by year. So by gaining space 
for the, for the sustainable mobility, gaining space for bicycles, and of course, uh, taking it um, uh, back or taking it away from, from cars, which are the less efficient and uh, mode of transport in cities. And by taking space from cars also to give it to, to uh, buses and to make, it, uh, make them work better, and also to take uh, away part, uh, take away um, some part of this space, uh, also to develop more uh, friendly pedestrian areas are the somehow the, the the strategies that we are trying to develop. The maybe what it's uh, more uh, known lately in Barcelona, it's a superblock strategy, which uh, have put uh, in the public arena debate that, that really that what we are challenging here is the role of cars in cities. And because of that, it has had uh, in Barcelona a, a huge uh, response and debate that we've been for two, three years trying to overcome to make this uh, strategy develop further. Because uh, with uh, that strategy, what we are really trying is to um, crack the city as, it, as, it, as we know as, and as it, it works today and to make it uh, uh, a different place in which uh, cars can have access to, to, every, to every facade somehow, to every building, because they, they are complying uh, a necessary mobility to many uh, aspects of, of, of cities, like freight, like uh, uh, people with disabilities, like, uh, many, well, many, uh, like uh, urban services that cannot be done yet by, by public or, by, or by, by public transport or by bicycles or by walking and you need the, the access of cars to every facade in the city, but in those spaces, <coughs> you don't have the priority somehow for the car. They can have access to those areas, but they don't have the priority. The priority, it's uh, given back to pedestrians and they gain more space and, they, and we free up space. Barcelona have a, a, a huge um, um, uh, resource infrastructure that has been created in the last uh, 20 years that is the, the parking, the parking uh, infrastructure underground because our uh, urbanism um, legislation um, requires for, to build uh, underground parking to every new, new building and we have at this moment more than um, six, uh, 600,000 parking space for a, for a, for a population of uh, one, uh, one million point seven people. So we have already uh, all, the spy, all, all the space that is needed for the cars uh, outside of the street. So we can now uh, man, uh, well, um, evaluate, well, we can uh, develop strategies in which we recover that space that is still um, used by, by cars, in this case, uh, that are parked there and to give back to other, to other users like uh, pedestrians and, and, and the use of bicycles and all, all these new uh, vehicles, uh, electric, that are, that are small. Another thing that, we, what, that Barcelona has a, a lack of is of green space. Uh, we've developed a very, very dense city. Uh, it was not uh, like this at the beginning. We have the Eixample uh, neighborhood in which uh, it was supposed to have double of, of the of I mean, for each, for each of the blocks, half of it was an open green space. It didn't, didn't develop like this at the end. You've seen that every block is completely surrounded by buildings and, uh, and, the, and most of the, of the insides of these blocks are inaccessible. So at the end, we need uh, not only by to gain this space for pedestrians, but also we need this, uh, this common space, public space, to, to make things other, other than, than move our, our, uh, ourselves around in cities to just uh, sit, chat, shop, uh, organize, uh, play for the kids. I mean, we've lost the capacity uh, of, play, of having kids playing in the streets uh, because of that, uh, that uh, taken over that the car have made of using all available space uh, in the surface for, for its own mobility. And in many cases, uh, th those cars and are not even um, moving for them for most of the day, yes. The, the statistics say more or less than 95% of, of time those cars are parked and not circulating. So we've detected that uh, approximately half of the streets in Barcelona are already um, used just as a, as, a, as, as a parking. I mean, they, they just have traffic when you are uh, looking for a place to park and when you are actually parking your car. And uh, we, we are trying to, to change that in that half uh, of, of the streets of Barcelona 
towards other, other, other uses because we have the infrastructure, the ability, because we, we are putting the, the public infrastructure uh, of, of transport uh, by, with buses and, and we have the underground and because we are uh, also developing the, a very uh, extent uh, bicycle network that are going to provide the capacity of doing uh, this, this uh, alternative mobility and do it, and do it in, a, in a safe way. The other topic that I have to go briefly is uh, the, um, the electrification of mobility because if we know that um, um, pedestrian and, and, and bikes are, uh, are the most uh, sustainable mode of transport because they don't have any emissions while uh, doing their commute. I mean, the next one is, of course, that, but at the end, we are going to have freight, urban services, many other. I mean, the, the, the public transport itself, it's going to have uh, it's having uh, um, nowadays uh, an important um, an important share of the of the of the emissions happening in cities. So we are also developing a strategy to for all the all the all the mobility that it remains that it that it's done by uh, by cars or by or by buses or by trucks to actually transform it to to uh, to electric to electric mobility. We have, uh, we and we are working this electric mobility from the, from the small scale because we are, for instance, our sh uh, share bike share scheme, it's, it's incorporating uh, electric bicycles, but also we have regulated to make it legal to circulate with, um, with those um, patinetes, what's the, uh, scooters. <laughs> um, in, in cities, we, are we have also a strategy to buying uh, zero, zero carbon car um, and buses in, 20, uh, in 20, uh, 2025, and to develop, uh, that's a, a, an agreement that we reached at the, the C40. So we are already buying half of, uh, well, uh, at this moment it's uh, around 25 of, of the buses that we are buying it are already electric, and the 40% and the, and the uh, that is remaining is already hybrid, and then we have uh, gas, and, but we are not buying any more diesels. So uh, that, that's another effort that we are trying. I mean, with, uh, with regards to public transport, with regards to um, personal mobility, with, re with regards to, to cars, we are also trying, we are implementing uh, different um, fiscalities. I mean, the, the for f in, in um, regarding uh, the, the type of car that you are using, we are developing a protocol uh, of uh, low emission zones to, for accessing Barcelona that will, um, prevent the most, uh, the, most co the, 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 the cars that are having more emissions to enter Barcelona and we'll, we'll, we'll make it as broad as it's necessary to, to actually meet the standards that the European uh, Commission, uh, the European Union is setting us as a maximum amount of, of emissions that we can have in the urban context. So um, super blocks on the, ma on the, on the hand of uh, pedestrians, uh, friendly cities and and well, a broad strategy that it's contemplating all, all mode of transport on the, on the second topic of uh, having and achieving a zero, zero carbon cities in a, in a short term. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have a seat, uh, like we uh, had designed this for a little bit of a conversation. Uh, we had changed our schedule, but we've just discovered our first keynote speaker has arrived, so we're making adjustments on the fly here. But I, I um, thank you for uh, the very illuminating presentation. I just had a couple of questions myself. We are going to open it up later for the audience Q&A and uh, any questions you might have uh, using ask and vote. Um, I, I, my own perception about um, personal mobility in Barcelona uh, is what I very much witness is this explosion of electric scooters, and I understand you also have electric bikes, mm -hmm. uh, um, rental bikes that are coming online in the next year. Um, and the real concern, again, is that uh, we're getting a tremendous plurality in our mobility options. We have uh, everything from big motorized vehicles to pedal bikes and pedestrians, but uh, we're finding increasing variation in speeds of vehicles, uh, power to weight ratios, levels of exposure, all of this, again, creates tremendous concerns about safety uh, for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, my understanding is Barcelona has introduced an ordinance, uh, some kind of personal mobility ordinance, which tries to somewhat regulate these modes and, and reduce some of the safety risk. I'm wondering if you could speak to that. 
Um, yeah, that, that is one of the points I was touching before. We have a uh, approval already one year and a half ago, an ordinance that uh, it's regulating the use of, of electric scooters in, in, the, in, the, in the streets of Barcelona. And it basically um, forbidding them to circulate in the, in the footpath in where pedestrians are supposed to have their own space. And also it's forbidding them to circulate in the, in the, in the most important streets where they have a lot of traffic. But for the rest of the city, which means that it's uh, around 60% uh, of the streets of Barcelona uh, and also all the bike lane infrastructure that we have developed, they can circulate. So they have already uh, more than 200 kilometers of bike paths that they can use, and they have uh, uh, more than 60% of, of, the, of the streets of Barcelona they, 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 they can already use in the carriage way as, they, as it was a, a, a motorbike. So uh, we are very concerned about uh, what uh, it's happening somehow at this point in the, in the footpath of Barcelona because the explosion of this kind of transports and also the, the explosion of the use of bicycles because we didn't have an, a, a safe infrastructure uh, for, them, for, for them to circulate within traffic or, or in the carriageway. Most of the, uh, there, are, there were many bike users that they were using the space of pedestrians in which, of course, they, they, they felt themselves safer. But that, of course, it's creating a back impact on, on, the other, on another collective of people that it's uh, using our streets by, by walking and, and mainly and also where with old people that they feel that, uh, that are uh, losing their comfortability and a safe place to actually walk. So we, didn't, we couldn't afford that and we are developing a strong strategy to take out all bicycles from, from the footpath without, try, without trying to, to um, do not develop at the same time their use or discourage their use and also to regulating all these type of vehicles that already outside of the footpath. Great. Um, one other question, and we'll, we'll turn to our uh, morning keynote speaker. Um, Barcelona has also become a global leader in uh, trying to encourage electric vehicles, particularly as it relates to your bus fleet, including articulated buses, but even garbage trucks. I think we've seen out here examples of that, a lot of the municipal fleet of vehicles. Um, what, one of the inhibitors we often hear about electrifying our vehicle fleets is the lack of electric charging infrastructure. And I'm just wondering, what is Barcelona doing to encourage um, employers or others to provide any kind of electric charging infrastructure or distribution networks for electricity to plausibly serve a, a rapidly growing demand for electric mobility? So can you speak to that to any degree? Yes, sure. Um, that is... Uh uh, very much a shared competence between uh, the municipality of Barcelona, the metropolitan area, the regional government, and also uh, the, uh, the, the state government. Uh, it's very difficult for a city to actually develop uh, or make it uh, more affordable. We have very, very, very little instruments that we can apply in the use of cars that are, that are going to, uh, to make, well, to develop the use of electric cars. We have uh, the regulations regarding uh, parking spaces. We can make a, a, dif a, difference, a discrimination of, of, on, on, on a pricing policy regarding which, car, which kind of car you're using. And also, we are developing the, the, the low emission zones, which also is going to have an impact regarding the motorization of vehicles. Uh, and on the other aspect, I mean, to facilitate the, the use, we have developed already um, a huge, uh, a very big infrastructure um, of, uh, of, of uh, charging points for, uh, for motorbikes, which uh, we have already more than uh, 100 points uh, of, of, of char 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 charging uh, points for, for motorbikes, and also we have developed it, um, a, a huge infrastructure of this uh, charging point on, on, on underground parkings. But on the surface, we don't think that that's the place to, uh, to actually um, stop for, for charging your car. We think that uh, that should happen in the underground spaces. So uh, on, that, on that policy, what we are trying is that this infrastructure is created on the, on the private and on the underground spaces. And on street, what you will find mainly is that uh, the, the supercharging uh, infrastructure 
that it's necessary on, in case of emergency, and, it, and which, uh, it, it will recharge your car very fastly. It's just half an hour. It's very expensive, but on an emergency situation, is the kind of, uh, of, uh, of charging facility that you will need. But um, cars or motorbikes or scooters have to work, electric ones, I mean, have to work at the end as we use our mobile, our smartphones, that uh, we use them during the day, and when we, we are sleeping, they are charging. And that's the, the same uh, aim that uh, we share with uh, both with the, uh, the um, um, metropolitan area and the regional government. And because of that, we are trying to develop this infrastructure in the, in the private and um, underground um, spaces instead of creating that infrastructure on the street. Okay, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insight. So please thank join you. me in thanking Mr. Nicholas. Um, so our, our, our keynote speaker for this morning's session is uh, the mayor of Tirana, Al Al Albania, um, Mr. Uh, er Erlan uh, Veliaj. Uh, he uh, has really established himself as a visionary and leader as it relates to advancing sustainable cities of the future. Uh, very much his platform is one of trying to give the, uh, the city back to citizens uh, through active engagement, including in the realm of, of uh, sustainable mobility. He's also um, being uh, applauded for his effort to green the city. Two million tree uh, belt will serve as sort of a green element uh, for addressing a whole host of environmental problems, but also uh, for uh, creating a more pedestrian friendly environment uh, for the city of Toronto. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming our morning keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Villiage. Please, thank you, Robert. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, this was very kind of you, Alvaro, to be such a good sport, and Robert uh, to cover me. Even a great city like Barcelona, on a rainy day, you get stuck. Uber doesn't work because it's overcrowded, and so is taxi, and so is the metro. And you know, walking uh, became an option for me this morning. So it was a way for me to experience the city in a rush hour on a, on a rainy day. But it goes to show that distances are important, and the way we design our cities are important. And you know, for a long period, whether it was in the desert or whether it was uh, in the suburbs, it was a status symbol to live away from the noise, to live in suburbia, in Pleasantville, and to sort of keep your distance from uh, the rest of humanity. And I think more and more we, we are realizing that distances do matter. And I think smart mobility is absolutely connected to smart distances and smart cities and the way we design. I'm going to go through a very, um, for which, which do I press? Do I press the? Let me try to figure out. Ah, I got it, I got it. So this is um, where I work. This is the view from my window. And actually, before it became like that, it was a big, big roundabout. So I think first we have to answer some questions about the values in our mobility. And the question number one is, why do we build cities? Some people plan roads and plan parking and plan roundabouts because some people mistakenly answer the question and they say, we build cities for cars. I think the ultimate answer is we build cities for people. I've seen cities without cars, but I haven't seen cities without people. And I think when we think of city assets, and we try to count the pavement, the asphalt, the roads, the trees, the street lights, then we forget the number one asset is people. And I think cities around people is probably the first answer we should give. Um, and you know, people doesn't mean only taxpayers and voters. It also means children. It means all people of all ages and all abilities. You know, everywhere in the world, we were in Geneva last week, we were talking to WHO about how pollution is now the number one cause of sickness in any big city. You know, we'd like to think it's cancer, we'd like to think it's dementia, we'd like to think it's Alzheimer's. Many of them actually derive from pollution. Pollution is the number one cause why people get sick in cities. So mobility is not an issue of convenience, it's also an issue of life and death. And the number of deaths that we get from bed mobility uh, is, an issue of, uh, is an issue of concern. So this was my first day in office. Um, so the picture is not the pretty one you saw in the beginning. Three years ago, this was the picture. And we saw from a Western society, the point of view from Barcelona, and many people probably in this room as well say, well, it works well because they're rich, they're part of the European Union. My statement here today is to say, look, Smart city doesn't mean expensive and doesn't mean a lot of money. It doesn't mean you use subsidies. 
Sometimes it really involves some smart thinking that any country can do. And my point today is if Tirana can do it, which was the North Korea of Europe until 1991, that means just about any other town can do it, even with the modest means that we have. And I'm going to go through a few examples that don't cost a lot of money, but are really key to reconceptualizing mobility, even in a developing uh, country uh, settlement. Um, so first is taking stock of what we're doing, where our values are. We asked our people in the very beginning, and we said, look, what is the most important thing in your life that the mayor should know? And they said, of course, it's my family. But what do you mean your family? Yeah, my children. They are the apple of my eye. They are the most important thing in my life. And we said, well, look, if, if your family is the most important thing in your children, would you agree that you spend most of your money raising your child? And people say, of course, Mr. Mayor. Why do you offend me? Of course, I spend most of my money raising my child. We said, you like to think that, but is it true? We calculated the average family was spending 30% of the income on the car, and only 20% on raising a child. We calculated the amount of money to buy a car, to park, to pay for the fuel, for the insurance, and for the mechanic was 50% higher than raising a child. And I think people were shocked because in, until 91, we didn't have any cars because it was a communist country. Then having a car was not a transport means, it was a status symbol. The bigger, the fancier the car, the more you could show off to your neighbor. And you say, look, we're, I'm not a communist anymore. I'm not poor anymore. I'm not uh, striving anymore. Now I have a car. And the car is my medallion of glory. So all of a sudden, we replaced communist dictators with another uh, worship symbol, which was the automobile. So once you've answered the questions of value, then you look at a bit the infrastructure. So we were looking at what, distance, what causes people to travel far away distances. And we found out that kindergartens that look like prisons, nurseries, schools, really became reasons why people would want to go somewhere else in, in search for a better infrastructure outside of their neighborhood. So the key is, how can we get top infrastructure within every neighborhood, even in a poor uh, developing country? So we figured out that by producing state of the art, sometimes through donations, sometimes through community work, sometimes through municipal finance, sometimes through parent associations, and really revamping local infrastructure, we found out that 50% of the traffic was cut simply by people getting services within 500 meters, half a kilometer, a, th a third of a mile, within their living area. And once your pharmacy, your baker, your uh, school, your kindergarten, your healthcare um, uh, station is within a walking distance that automatically cuts um, uh, traveling time and mobility needs. And I think this is where planners are extremely important. There's now ways you can do it with computer. You can measure cell phone data where people are moving, and you can find out that a lot of the useless, we found out that in the city of Tirana, we made 800,000 trips a day with cars. 400,000 trips were less than one kilometer that you could easily walk if this infrastructure um, existed. So we, we invested a lot of time and a lot of fundraising and also community involvement in building state-of-the-art schools and also facilities that would keep people uh, resting in their, in their community. Now, What do we use schools for? Some people mistakenly think schools are places where we park kids for six hours. That's one way to look at it. But we can also see it as a community center. One idea we developed with Stefano Boeri out of Milan is that in a place like Albania, where during the transition, people were rushing to occupy public space, you know, in some places they call it favela, or informal settlements, or whatever you want to do it, you, you want to call it. But the idea is that public space became scarce. Because you went from a regime where public space only belonged to the Communist Party to a casino capitalism regime where public space is free for grabs. And pretty much in the Wild West, in the States, where the first one who can put a flag pretty much owns uh, the land. That was very sad. But you cannot undo history. So we say, well, look, if the remaining public space is schools, why do we use them only for six hours? What if we use schools 24 hours a day as community centers, as places where we could do sports, as places where we could be safe? Um, and then we found out that this was one of the great concepts that actually got people off the streets and off neighborhoods that were occupied with cars and into safe environments within a walking distance in some of these state-of-the-art schools. So it's sometimes it's only about reconceptualizing what you already have instead of complaining that you don't have enough to do what you need to do. 
And I'm happy Alvaro mentioned the concept of play. One of the reasons we have horrible politicians, most likely, as Freud would say, they had horrible childhoods. They didn't get enough play. Uh, they didn't know how, what it means to share space, to be in a team. Uh, they were bullies. They wanted all the toys for themselves. You know, when you play, you learn a, a lot of character. And it's not only about health and physical activity, which is very important, but it's also about character. So we put a lot of emphasis on the concept of, um, of play. And we found out that designing top play spaces pretty much puts a bet on the next generation. Now, I'm a politician. I hate to say it, but I fall into that category. When I have to fill a card and they put the options, you, I, I tick that box. As a politician, you're constantly surrounded by pollsters and analysts and consultants and advisors who say, Mr. Mayor, all we have to worry about is taxpayers and voters. If they are happy, we win. If they're not happy, we don't win. Is it really so? Are we only thinking about the next election? Or are we also thinking about the next generation? Because I think we've seen that the drama of only thinking about the next election hasn't produced sustainable societies. So I think the concept of play and investing in play as a pure, uh, I think, bargain uh, for the next generation is, um, is extremely important. So um, I agree with Alvaro. Whether you're Barcelona or Tirano, Tirana or Toronto or Tokyo or Kigali, I think the concept of play is universal. And children at play are probably the most common language you see just about um, anywhere else in the, in the world. I remember when we first started uh, this, uh, this playgrounds, there was a huge outcry, mostly from opposition groups. And we had huge protests, uh, some of them very violent, because they're saying, I cannot believe, you know, in a city that has so many needs, we are spending so much time about games. Well, it turned out it was one of our best investments. Because a child at play also attracts a parent, a grandparent. Uh, we can see now grandparents uh, going outdoors and enjoying sports and public life. Now, and you know, high quality spaces with which any country can do. It, you know, it doesn't really take much to put some grass and clean up some of the public, uh, public spaces. Now, we found out that in the 36 places where we built PlayStations, crime went down. This is the year when we had the lowest crime rate in history. For a city of a million people, we've only had eight murders. Four of them um, domestic issues, and four of them probably gangsters. But one of the lowest crime rates in Europe, in one actually the poorest aspiring member um, of the European Union. So sometimes there's an urban myth, and you say poor countries kill each other. Well, you know, London is not poor. They're stabbing each other every day. And Chicago is not poor. It's the richest country in the world. Uh, you know, the mayor of Chicago said, I'm gonna, not going to run anymore because it's gone out of control. And we found out that in places where we had play stations, so places of play for children, we found out that crime went down. As Jane Jacobs used to say, cities need eyes on the street. The more people there are on the street and the more hours of the day they are out and about, the safer it is. You don't need police station. A granny is sometimes a much more effective police station than anyone else in, uh, in uniform. Um, so there's this concept of using sports and turning these places 24-7 uh, and the use of squares and public space, which Barcelona is great, so I'm not going to bore you to death. And then in the evenings, you can have big concerts. And then if you're lucky enough, then Rita Ora shows up and then uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, we were here in Barcelona to receive an award about, um, about uh, the best public space in Europe for 2018 at the Center of uh, Contemporary Culture. But we also had to share the story that, you know, as you know, people don't live in the square. I mean, you go to the square for an event, for Christmas, for New Year's, but you know, you live in your neighborhood 90% of the, of the time. So we found out it's actually working with Barcelona. What are other reasons people go out to the house? Mostly to buy food, to make sure you survive the day and you wake up tomorrow and can carry on and get energy for the day. So we found out that food spaces or places where people go and buy food are important. So we took a survey what distances people are making to go and buy food, and what places have we built where people go and nurture uh, themselves. I'm almost done. So we looked at this place and we said, look, we got to change uh, these community spaces. And showing up for food uh, is something we've done for the last two million years. You know, you wake up, whether you're a caveman or a metropolitan uh, inhabitant, you wake up in the morning, you want to eat, uh, and you go to hunt. Uh, now, not with a spear, but you go um, and buy food. So we found out that transforming places where people go and buy food 
is extremely important not as a means of physical nutrition, but also spiritual nutrition. Breaking bread is a tradition, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim, the tradition of breaking bad, bread, <laughs> breaking bad is another story, another movie. Uh, <laughs> please don't do that tradition. <laughs> but breaking bread um, is a tradition that is nurtured in all of our societies. So the experience of buying food, we found out, could transform also mobility needs and the desire of people to walk to a pretty place rather than rush to an ugly place where you just get your food and you don't want to associate with that ugliness anymore. Now, the last point um, I want to make, and still, this is how food places can be, can be fun and how sports can get a city, is this issue of um, um, electrical transport. Some people think, well, this is only for rich countries, right? Because, you know, who can afford uh, an expensive electric uh, bus? Now, there are certain ways to deal with it, even for a poor country. We just passed some legislation where we reduce to zero tariffs, customs, and taxes for any um, electrical bus, which all of a sudden makes it more convenient for companies who otherwise could not afford something that is 30% over the market price of a Euro 6 diesel or any other traditional way of transport. And I think Sometimes it's not about subsidizing, but finding incentives to make it exciting and to also make it affordable. In the end, as the saying goes, it's all about the money. So unless even poor countries produce incentives, whether it's electric cars or buses, it's not going to work. Uh, the fact that it looks fancy and it's offered in the, in the Expo City Fair is just not enough. In the end of the day, the operator has to do the accounting, and doing the right accounting and helping with these incentives absolutely makes a, makes a difference. Bike spaces are critical. Uh, when we came in office, people said, look, it's never going to happen. We're not Amsterdam. Well, you know, Amsterdam was not Amsterdam in 1970. And Groningen and Utrecht and Rotterdam, there were no displays. Mayors were getting death threats uh, from people who were upset that these bike lanes were popping uh, everywhere. But again, for you who are managers, it's an issue of values. The question is, what is more important, a citizen on a 100,000 euro BMW X5 or a citizen on a 100 euro bike? Well, the question is, or I hope the, question is, the answer is, <laughs> they are the same. The fact that you are on a more expensive horse doesn't make you more worthier uh, to a society as a citizen, as a voter, as a taxpayer, as part of our, of our community. So once you've answered this question, then there is no doubt that you should share public space democratically. Uh, you know, if the city has 200,000 cars, but it has a million people. The 80% of the people who don't own a car are also owners of public space. So I think once you've answered that question, then it's easy to go ahead with pop-up infrastructure that can be very, uh, and then Mobike, and I'm not going to bore you with that. But one last point I want to make is about this concept of trees, uh, the two million trees. Uh, the issue of parking, we can maybe talk during the conversation. I think parking should be made more expensive in every city. People don't pay enough. Cars move only 5% of their life. 95% of the time, they're occupying real estate that is very expensive. One square meter in Barcelona is very expensive. So why should it be rented out for one euro an hour? Uh, but that we can talk more about. But this issue of trees, uh, I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, of this orbital forest. It started with planning, but the question is, how can a poor city afford two million trees? So then we started this little game, and we asked kids, we said, if all the kids in Tirana could plant one tree for their birthday on a GPS location that you could download from the city uh, website, and then you can tag your tree, it will be with you for life for the next uh, 100 years. What would happen if we could crowdsource the largest tree planting operation in Europe purely by inviting kids to plant a tree for their birthday? It started a revolution, and it didn't cost the city one penny. It was m basically getting um, uh, kids for their birthdays, for their anniversaries, for the passing of a parent, for the birth, birth of a new child. And it really became a virus. You were completely uncool in your class if you did not plant a tree. And now we do it every year. So at the rate of about 100, 150,000 trees a year, we will definitely, within a decade, uh, reach our ambition. And again, another example how a poor country can subcontract to the rest of society an operation that otherwise you'd need millions of euros to do. I know my uh, very generous host uh, is running out of patience, so I'm going to shut it here. Uh, but if there's any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Thank you very much. So, um, so um, what, what a, a colorful festive presentation. So I, 
we, we really heard the importance of designing a city from the perspective of children. So I think all of us embrace this idea of natural surveillance, Jane Jacobs' principles of humanist planning. Uh, could I ask Alvaro to come to the stage? And we're going to open it up now to audience Q&A. Uh, our schedule has gotten thrown off a little bit. If um, you would indulge me, I would request that um, we uh, cut our networking break down to 10 minutes. So we have five or eight minutes for a little bit of Q&A. So with that, could I invite any audience members now? Uh, do you have questions to either uh, Etienne or Alvaro, uh, having heard their presentations this morning? Um, and if not, I'm going to uh, grab questions from the, uh, uh, and there are no questions. OK, th this woman here, please uh, come to the microphone. Um, I have a question for Arion. Uh, Arion, thanks a lot. It's very nice listening to you. I'm actually from Pristina, and uh, I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering because I'm I live in Finland, but I'm very interested uh, in the developing in the Balkans, and I was just interested to know more about how are you cooperating with the other cities in the yeah. region, because I know I mean you're doing a great work, but I know that there's a lot of uh, problems there, so. Please. Do you want me to take, take it now? Yeah, the very, very good question. And I think the importance is knowledge needs to be shared. Uh, and we don't do that enough. And I, that's why I love, uh, I've been coming here for the, the past three years, because it's a sharing community. Um, one of the, you refer to other cities in the Balkans, one of the advantage of being disadvantaged is that you can leapfrog. Uh, so why am I going to bother building trams with cables and you know, do something that Europe did for the last 100 years, if we can jump immediately to electric cars. You know, I was sharing with some friends last night. Um, my first day in office, I, I get mail. And I get letters from, uh, th from the public. You get them every day, but this was my first day, so I'm excited. I said, oh, I wonder what they write to the mayor. So someone is writing a, a letter and says, Mr. Mayor, I'm so-and-so, I'm 80 years old, I've, I you know, really care about the city. I thought you should know that I, this woman in the second floor is sleeping with this guy in the fourth floor of our apartment building. <laughs> I said, why do I need to know this? It's a free country. You can sleep with who, whoever you want. But then my team was saying, look, they come from this communist tradition when they feel they need to tell everything to the government. And the government should know what TV people are watching, you know, who's going out with who, you know, if there's any subversive uh, visiting them or a cousin that lives abroad, you know, speaks ill about communism. Stuff that you'd hear in North Korea today. So I said, well, fine. This is a dumb thing that someone is spying about who's sleeping with who. But clearly, he put effort. You know, he wrote a letter. He took time. He thought about it. Uh, it's completely useless, but clearly energy is being poured that we need to channel somewhere else. So we developed with Vodafone this, uh, this uh, application. Uh, it's called Tirana Ime, My Tirana. And we basically asked these people, look, it's great that you want to tell on everything. But can we use it for more uh, helpful things, like potholes, like burnt street lights, or like a uh, missing tree? So then we found out 20,000 people regularly are, are using all this energy with a very simple, that even an 80-year-old can use, uh, where you could basically take a picture, upload in your GPS. We have only three people. Instead of 1,000 inspectors, we have a dispatch team of three people who take eight-hour shifts in a computer. They basically dispatch it to a team. They go and fix it. So the granddad now receives a pop-up uh, picture on how it got fixed. So he feels all that energy instead of, you know, peeking who's sleeping with who in the neighborhood, he's actually now looking for problems that he can report. And the city, instead of paying a 1,000 inspectors sa fake salaries for people sipping cappuccino and latte all day in the Balkans, uh, is now using all that money to actually uh, get investment. So I think a low-cost, actually a zero-cost investment like this, any city can do. You don't have to be a member of the European Union. You don't have to get any funds. You don't have to raise your taxes. This is n a no-brainer. And one of the things we're sharing in this platform of, of cities in the Balkans that we are trying to promote is that let's learn. And let's find some quick fixes with zero cost. OK, uh, this gentleman here, you had a question, please. And you could just briefly say your name. Yeah. Yeah, Erian, hi. Uh, my name is Karl Hendrik. I work as an urban planner in uh, Scandinavia, Norway. Uh, thank you for your outstanding presentation. Uh, you, you gave a lot of uh, great energy to us. 
Um, uh, Norway is a rich country, but uh, our challenge is not uh, the inhabitants or politicians, but old-fashioned engineers and planning authorities. Uh, we have national, uh, national Public Road Administration, and for decades they have only have built motorways. Uh, it's the only thing they can. And now suddenly come some uh, stupid young guys like you and me yeah. and say, hey, bicycle is cool. And they are saying, are you crazy? I want to build motorways. Yeah. So, um, and I don't want to wait 20 years until they retire. So how do we get rid of these guys? Hmm? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. You know, answer number one is vote them out. Uh, but yeah, to be fair to Norway, I think Oslo is doing a major, major uh, innovation. Actually, we took a lot of the ideas for tax breaks and customs-free electric cars from Oslo. So some good stuff is, is happening, to, to be fair um, to Norway. But again, it's a, it's a question of values. For the last two million years, humans have been run, running and walking. It's only the last 70 years that we've been driving cars, right? So our natural being is to be up and about. It's not this. This is not a, you know, birds fly, fish swim, humans run and walk. And, and we forget that. And we think that we've been driving cars uh, for millennia. It's, this is simply not true. Genetically, we're still not deformed yet. Our, our, our natural call is to stand up, to run, and to walk. Um, and I think we, we forget to call on our basic, uh, basic values. The industry pressure is uh, important. I, now I speak as a politician. These road builders, they finance campaigns. So, you know, when Donald Trump says, I'm going to put this many trillions on the roads, he's basically saying to his donors, you know, I'll pay you back and we'll just build more roads so then you can get your money back from the campaign. So I think number one is you have to fight the political system. This is not about the crazy engineer who does things the old way. No, this is basically about political decision making. And I know many people say, oh, I hate politics. Well, hate it all you want, but that's where decisions get made. So I think if I were you, I would fight the politicians who make these decisions and not necessarily the engineer who out of inertia may have been building roads, but I've found very old engineers in City Hall right before retirement. But once the mayor says, no, 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 crazy, no, we're not going to do this. Those engineers very well can design uh, bike lanes as well. So I don't think it's an issue of trade, the trade of the engineers and urban designers. It's an issue of political will. Okay. Um, we, we, we are, okay. We, well, we'll let this gentleman, and this will be the final question, and then we'll take our break. I would invite the audience members to come forward and uh, during the break to speak to our speakers here. Please. Hi, good morning. Uh, Giacomo Dalisa, University of Coimbra. Thank you very much for the talk. I just want to uh, point uh, uh, your storytelling, let's say. You, you are telling us a story about your city, and we believe you. Uh, of flourishing, okay? Uh, and basically what, what you are saying also is that uh, the commons uh, that you are creating because you socialize through your civil society and citizen uh, process inside the society that give well-being without, uh, let's say, uh, targeting the economic growth, let's say. So uh, from an economic perspective, I will say that you are underperforming your uh, your city because you don't really uh, are focusing on the main target of all the mayor of all the city in Europe at least and in the westernized society. So what you will suggest to the mayor and your colleague that uh, on the other side they won't just focus on economic growth and don't look at the possibility of increasing well-being and flourishing of the city without uh, commodifying any piece of our life and our city. Thanks. Well, I would, I would be a liar if I said that I don't worry about economic growth, about jobs, because in the end of the day, it's through those taxes that the city runs. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is that working on this acupuncture, are you, are you Italian? I say Napolitano, si, si, capisco. Um, so we work with Mayor De Magistris, and we work, we actually work with a lot of Italian architects. Stefano Boeri, Marco Casamonti, Renzo Piano, Mario Cucinella. And their frustration is that many mayors, they're afraid to take risks. My suggestion to mayors or to any politicians is that, look, when you run for office, it's like you, you own a credit card. Why do you get a credit card if you're not going to charge it? So, of course, you lose some credit in the meantime to make difficult decisions. But if they're the right ones, they will pay back and they will refill your credit card in the next uh, election. 
And some politicians who are constantly afraid, I've, I've seen politicians in Italy, they poll to find out what they should think. No, you have your views, you have your values, you have a platform when you run, you have to keep them. You poll to find out how much more you need to communicate your vision, not to find out what you should think and then become a populist. Now, Italy is now going through a major wave of populism. You know, this is exactly where you want to tell people exactly what they want to hear. That, you know, the immigrants are taking our jobs, the Muslims are blowing us up. I happen to live in a country that is mixed. Christians, Muslims, they get along very well. I officiate weddings every day, Muslims and Christians. Um, so to me, this is not a drama at all. But I think running on this platform of fear and trying to find out what people's worst fears are and make them your political platform is a very short-lived gain. And I think eventually Italy and other countries will go back to, to, to the pendulum. But economic growth is absolutely connected to city beautification. We call these interventions acupuncture. I'm very aware that the city needs major modernization. As I'm speaking here right now, I have a major protest in City Hall for decisions about stuff like this. You, it comes with a price. Um, you have to understand this is not a beauty competition. You don't have to be liked by everyone. But you do need to have uh, a, a critical consensus, a critical mass of people that wants to move in the right direction. And if some people, if loud minorities, loud minorities exist in Barcelona all the time for just about every decision. But if you allow loud minorities to decide your agenda, then you've lost completely the cause. And we have found out that in, city, in places where we went pedestrian, shops opened. In this market, when uh, we started there, 23 people worked. Now, 3,000 people work in the whole regeneration area. So intuition may, may get you to think that unless you allow motor vehicles, uh, you will not get any economic growth. Actually, facts prove otherwise. Uh, the less uh, motor vehicle traffic and more pedestrian, more people have time to shop and to take a bike and to take people for a treat. And I think economic growth is a result and not, uh, and not an impediment to city and good ur urban planning. Okay, um, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to bring this to a close, but uh, please join me again in thanking our two speakers this morning. Um, uh, so please, uh, we uh, are Very going, nice we do Thank have a follow-up session. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute networking break. There's coffee in the back. Uh, there'll be a session that follows. Uh, both of our morning speakers are here, so if you didn't have a chance to ask a question, feel free to come forward. So again, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. No, no, but you're doing amazing stuff. So um, thank you for returning to our second part of this session. I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator, uh, Mr. Oscar Chamat. Uh, Oscar is a senior consultant in urban innovation, uh, currently working with the Barcelona Council on Bikeway Network Expansion. He's also a lecturer in smart cities in Colombia and produces Ciudad Hub, a podcast about innovation in cit uh, cities. So, uh, Oscar, the floor is yours, please. Thank, thank you, uh, Robert, for your introduction. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you for coming to Barcelona, and thank you for being here the last day of Smart City Expo World Congress. Today, we will have a share about urban innovation, but applied in some sub some topic that in almost every city in the world agree the importance of mobility in cities. And what is more interesting is that we are going to have three different perspectives, hopefully four, because we are still waiting for one more <laughs> last minute speaker. But uh, so far we have three different scales of, of how cities are dealing with mobility, how cities are dealing with technology, and what are the perspectives of impact in, in the cities. Uh, to have an idea in general how important is the city is, is always important as a moderator to give some numbers to set up the discussion. Uh, cities occupy only the 2% of the surface of the earth. However, they produce 70% of the GDP, but also they generate 60% of the greenhouses effect. So we have facing a problem, we are facing an opportunity, and cities has to deal with that. In that order of ideas, we will have three presentations with three different scales of the territory. The first one from Doha, who is, who is going to explain, Mr. Ali, who is going to explain us a very concrete project 
then we are going to go up in the scale of the territory. The idea is the second c the uh, scale of the city that we are still waiting. And then we are going to Chile with Nicolás, who is going to explain us uh, what are they doing to promote uh, zero emission transportation. And then one even bigger uh, scale of the territory with Mariola, who is going to explain us what is going, what is happening in C40 regarding the zero emission cities and pedestrian cities. So what is important here is the presentation of our speakers, but first of all, I would like to remind you to use the Ask and Vote application to get your feedback. At the, at the end, sorry, at the end we will have also uh, questions and answers, but please use the Q&A uh, app to also send the questions, okay? Mr. Lee, welcome to Barcelona. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm here today to share with you we uh, have a project, Mishir of Down Doha, which have started actually in 2009. It's a sustainable project, and uh, we are care about sustainability and the smart city and uh, mobility. So uh, starting is, uh, with the location of the, our project, we are located in Qatar, and the capital of Qatar, Doha, is actually uh, an old city which we, which we have demolished, and we have started to redevelop a new city. Uh, here, just uh, some statistics about our project. It's a comprehensive integrated city, uh, consists of 100 buildings and the three to six basements under the ground. Uh, mixed use development. We have four different hotels, residential buildings, uh, commercial buildings, four museums. We have even a school which has been under operation for the last uh, three years. And uh, we are expecting, as you can see here, by uh, 2,100 uh, as a population and 20,000 jobs and uh, 50,000 uh, as a daily visitor to our project. So mobility is really a uh, key uh, things that we have to think about how those 50,000 are going to be moving uh, in the city. So moving on just to give you the uh, superstructure of, uh, and uh, the super block of our uh, organization or our project. This is the basement three to six basement under the ground. The first thing here, as you can see, the red lines here. The red lines is consist of uh, service tunnels. So all the service trucks or the uh, services uh, that need required by the hotels, by retail areas, all of it under the ground. So you will be walking in the ground floor without even seeing any trucks that moving in the, uh, on the ground. Everything is under the ground and nobody is allowed to see that. And this is the vehicular movement that we are offering. And this is uh, near to us is the biggest station of Metro. Uh, and uh, this connect our project, or which is the, our city, Mushairib, to the rest of the cities in Qatar. And this is the pedestrian uh, movement within the site. Now, you have to know that uh, I don't know if uh, most of you have been, uh, in the, been in the Middle East or not, but there it's, to walk in there in the summer is a little bit challenge since the uh, weather is, uh, is a little bit ho hot in the summer. So I will walk with you through my presentation. How are we trying to do as much as possible to improve in that? First, sustainability. This is uh, just only to abbreviate what sustainability is to meet the need of the uh, present without compromising the need of the future generations. And all our buildings are uh, LEED certified and they are green buildings. Now here, the key principle that we have on the sustainability, uh, the con connectivity is a first principle and uh, require less energy, less water, and create less waste. Connectivity. So as you can see here, this is the pedestrian that we uh, movement within our development at uh, all our intersections are signalized. We have pedestrian street only and uh, bicycle friendly, uh, secure bike parking we have provided. And also we have provided shower and locker facilities for the people who's, who's uh, visiting the, the area. We have three trams, electrical trams, that's uh, serving the whole development. And by that, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, it's much easier to the environment and no CO emission for the, for the trams. And uh, as I said, it's a little bit hard. So we try to make our site or the project as much alive as possible by using light colors. This is uh, a lot of water feature that we have done, uh, awnings and shadings everywhere. And here, for example, this is a big area which has the biggest retractable roof, canopy. And you can see that roof, it's uh, extendable. So it will be covering the whole area during the summer. 
and people can walk and enjoy, and, uh, it, and we can close it. Uh, a lot of lighting effects and the public art, custom street furniture. And also, during the master planning and the design, we have uh, studied the natural element. So the direction of the wind is coming from the north. So we built the low-rise building in the front, the high-rise building in the back. So the, we allow the wind to cross the whole development without obstruction. The other than that is the sun movement. So to benefit as much as possible from the shading. So we, can, we are trying to, as much as possible to make the pedestrian street shaded and to allow them to walk and to enjoy the, uh, the, the, the place. And of course, in the three to six basement underground, we are offering 10,000 or plus uh, car parks. And all these car parks, uh, uh, no, no car parks are allowed to be parked in the ground floor. And we have bollards to ensure that nobody will allow uh, park there. We, have, we are providing the electrical charging station for electrical uh, cars. And we are, uh, the priority parking will be given for the fuel efficient vehicles. And uh, as I said earlier, the delivery of the trucks is also under the ground, independent of car traffic. So different uh, line. This is in terms of mobility. Just to give you a hint about the, what you are doing in terms of sustainability in general. So less energy, we are saving around 30% of energy in, uh, in uh, water and the, uh, in using the district cooling, two center of district cooling. And uh, we, are, we have 6,400 solar panels that are uh, generating uh, uh, electrical power and heating 75% of the water. And the water consumption, we need a daily, this is daily consumption of the water of our development is 9,822 cubic meter. So that's just to give you a hand, this is equivalent of four Olympic swimming pool daily I'm talking about here. So what we are doing here to save the water is uh, use the toilet and uh, bathroom fixtures to be water efficient. And not all the water need to be portable water to be used. So we are using the portable water only in shower, sinks, and uh, washing clothing, but treated water will be used for irrigation, cooling purposes, and the toilet flushing. And also we are collecting the rainwater uh, and consideration and reusing it again. In terms of uh, create uh, less waste, we have the waste auto automatic waste collection system, which is uh, we, uh, it's mainly about segregating the waste into two or three different categories and connecting all the building and collecting the waste under the ground. So mixed use recyclable food waste, mixed waste. I believe I have exceeded my time. It was fine. And then I tried as much to cover as much as possible my projects. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much for being absolutely on time. That's oh, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. And I have to ask you for apologize because I didn't introduce you and I didn't say something very important. This project last night won the Governance Awards uh, as one of the most leading projects in the Smart City Expo World Congress. So we are lucky and we, I apologize to not introduce you and to not make you this. And on top of that, you make very good on time. Thank you. Uh, Nicolás Grande, he is coming from Chile uh, in Spanish, yes. He is the head of a Smart City Unit uh, at the Minister of Tas Transport and Telecommunication of Chile, where he serves as a national coordinator for Chilean smart cities. Nicolás has promoted, led, and implemented the Smart City Social and Technological Innovation Initiatives aimed at improving mobility. Nicolás, welcome to Barcelona. Gracias. He's going to speak in Spanish, so please, if you need to uh, translate it. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, agradecer la oportunidad nuevamente a la organización del Congreso Smart City de Barcelona por tener la oportunidad de compartirles el trabajo que estamos realizando en Chile, sobre todo a propósito del camino de Chile hacia un transporte público de baja emisión y eléctrico. Quisiera partir contándoles que estamos viviendo uno de los mayores cambios y estamos siendo protagonistas de uno de los mayores cambios culturales y transformaciones tecnológicas en el contexto del transporte público a nivel mundial. Hoy día nos hemos puesto eh, los guantes y hemos iniciado un proceso de transformación del transporte público donde ya tenemos en, los próximos, eh, en las próximas semanas 
vamos a ver circular por las calles de la ciudad de Santiago 200 buses eléctricos y al mismo tiempo 490 buses con estándar Euro 6. Eso significa que el nuevo piso, el nuevo estándar de transporte público para Chile, lo está instalando la ciudad de Santiago, la ciudad donde vive el 40% de la población a nivel nacional. Y eso significa una serie de, de desafíos, no solo en el momento de la implementación, sino que también de la explotación y, futuro, y, y a futuro nuevos desafíos. Este nuevo estándar fue pensado centrado en las personas. Lo que buscamos principalmente es elevar el nivel de servicio, el estándar de servicio que le estamos entregando a los ciudadanos, incorporando buses que vienen con conexiones USB, que incorporan tecnología Wi-Fi para que los ciudadanos puedan conectarse y trabajar eventualmente en este espacio público que es el movimiento, que es el transporte público, y de esta manera poder ir generando una mejora a los usuarios, pero al mismo tiempo una mejora en el sistema, porque la electromovilidad de cierta manera tiene beneficios asociados a los costos operacionales que significa el sistema. Pero esta transformación que estamos hoy día viviendo está en un marco. Hoy el presidente de la República ha anunciado, bueno, hace meses atrás anunció el plan de transporte del tercer milenio, que busca transformar el transporte público en Chile, no solo en Santiago, sino que a nivel nacional. Y partimos ya el año pasado con la inauguración del primer metro autónomo, que es la línea 6, y que tiene hoy día 15 kilómetros de, de, de longitud, 10 estaciones de metro. Y próximamente, durante los próximos meses, vamos a ver la inauguración de la línea 3, que tiene 22 kilómetros con 20 estaciones. El objetivo de este plan es que al 2026 pasemos de 6 líneas de metro a 10 líneas de metro, de tal manera que el, la red de metro se transforme en, en, la, en, en la vía estructurante del sistema de transporte público de la ciudad de Santiago y desde ahí empezar a construir todo el complemento a través del de transporte público de buses y también, por qué no, el transporte de taxis colectivos, que hoy día ya contamos con 60 vehículos de taxis colectivos que son eléctricos. Esto partió este año. Estamos también desde la mirada de la infraestructura, creando infraestructura exclusiva para el transporte público eléctrico de buses este año también estamos implementando el corredor de electromovilidad, el primer electrocorredor, donde la idea es que circulen buses principalmente eléctricos, con un nuevo estándar también de zonas de paga extravehicular, para poder generar las eficiencias también al momento de subirse a los buses. Pero todo esto que les he contado no hubiese sido posible si no hubiésemos estado orquestando este ambicioso plan desde antes. Lo que fue pasando hace un, dos años atrás, fue que operadores de servicio de transporte público, junto con la empresa de energía y algunos asociados, pudieron implementar pilotos con tres buses eléctricos que nos permitieron tener una primera aproximación respecto a qué significa esta tecnología y los desafíos que esto impone. De esta manera, con estos pilotos pudimos también tener un, una especie de sensor respecto de qué es lo que la ciudadanía pensaba de este tipo de tecnología y si la ciudadanía también quería avanzar hacia este nuevo estándar. Ahí tenemos algunos datos. Las personas evaluaron de una escala de 0 a 7 en 6.3 el sistema de transporte eh, de bus eléctrico. Y por otra parte, como un trabajo de prospección realizado e impulsado por el Ministerio de Transporte y la Unidad de Ciudades Inteligentes, en conjunto con Corfo, que es la Corporación de Fomento Productivo, es una entidad pública de Chile, y una colaboración privada con el Centro Mario Molina y una cooperación internacional con el BTT de Finlandia y la Autoridad de Transporte de Finlandia, pudimos hacer un intercambio de conocimiento que nos permitió, primero, confirmar que el impulso de transporte público iba a permitir poder avanzar hacia esta transformación de la movilidad eléctrica a nivel nacional. El foco está puesto en el transporte público, entendiendo que la infraestructura que va a generar este sistema va a permitir generar la movilización para que los vehículos privados empiezan a generar esta transformación. Pero también esta coordinación, este consorcio público-privado, queríamos que fuese orientado a la implementación. Estábamos viendo mucha, eh, eh, mucha, muchas acciones eh, de, de explotación, 
de promoción de la electromovilidad, pero nada orientado a la implementación. Y este consorcio nos permitió establecer la primera base de conocimiento desde qué significaba esta tecnología y cuáles eran los riesgos o los beneficios asociados a los temas operacionales de transporte público, qué infraestructura se requería, qué tipos de tecnología existían y cómo eso podía ser implementado en un contexto de Santiago, un sistema de transporte público estresado, que tiene mucha exigencia, y lo que no queríamos era que este salto tecnológico significara que se deteriorara la calidad de servicio en el sistema de transporte público. Entonces queríamos que este, esta transición fuese, ojalá, lo mejor posible. Se establecieron objetivos, la idea es que de aquí al 2025, en el sistema de transporte público de Santiago, tengamos de entre 1.500 y 2.000 buses eléctricos, un tercio de la flota de transporte público en la ciudad, y con un objetivo de largo plazo, que al 2050 tengamos en Chile un transporte público 100% eléctrico. Tenemos algunos aprendizajes ya. Lo primero es que esto fue un cambio de paradigma. Si antes nos teníamos que ocupar solo del bus y la eficiencia del bus, hoy día tenemos que pensar en el bus y toda la infraestructura de acompañamiento que tiene que tener este bus para que pueda funcionar de manera adecuada. Eso significa la red de carga, eso significa conductores que sepan conducir de manera eficiente, porque el sistema eléctrico es, tiene una conexión también con la batería y las cargas, tanto en el frenado como en el acelerado, por lo tanto se requiere una conducción eficiente y todo ese conocimiento lo fuimos adquiriendo a propósito de todos estos trabajos. Se requiere un trabajo colaborativo, no basta con un ministerio de transporte que esté impulsando esta agenda, se requiere trabajar en conjunto con el ministerio de energía, con el ministerio de medio ambiente y con el ámbito privado. Necesitamos establecer conversaciones y espacios de, de, de conversación para poder hacer las coordinaciones, porque este trabajo convoca a muchos actores y requiere tener un ecosistema muy fuerte que te ayude a impulsar esta agenda. Y definitivamente los líderes son claves. Pero estas condiciones eh, y estos aprendizajes se fueron porque también existen condiciones que habilitaron todo este trabajo. Primero, hay una agenda clara, una visión de transporte público impulsado por la autoridad. Tenemos autoridades, eh, hay, hay un proceso también de renovación de contratos en el sistema de transporte público de Santiago, lo que nos permite también pensar en hacer una transición hacia un transporte público eléctrico. Tenemos liderazgos, los liderazgos son clave, pero no solamente el liderazgo político que hoy día lo tenemos en la autoridad, en, el, en la ministra y en el subsecretario, sino que también el liderazgo asociado a lo técnico. Emergen liderazgos desde distintas miradas, desde la academia, desde el sector público, desde el mismo ámbito público, eh, privado, que nos va ayudando en este camino. Una actitud activa eh, de, del ámbito de, de energético y también desde el punto de vista de, de los operadores de transporte público, también hay un compromiso por querer mejorar y llevar la calidad de servicio en el ámbito de superficie. Tenemos desafíos, los buses... Hoy día tenemos tres, mañana tendremos 100. Y por lo tanto, tenemos desafíos desde el ámbito operacional, tenemos que construir capital humano que permita soportar toda esta transformación, generar conocimiento, vamos a tener buses que nos van a empezar a reportar datos. Chile se puede transformar en una plataforma donde vamos a conocer, finalmente, cómo estos sistemas se pueden introducir en ciudades complejas como Santiago. Necesitamos crear un ecosistema de innovación que nos ayude, eh, evidentemente, registrar la experiencia para compartirla y escalarla a otras ciudades de Chile y también pensar en el final, qué va a pasar con las baterías cuando una vez lleguen a su vida útil, tenemos que eso también convertirlo eh, y reutilizarlo eventualmente. Muchas gracias. Thank, thank you, Nicolás, for your presentation. I would like to highlight some very common aspects of the first two presentations, how technology are creating new environments to make the city nicer to the people. In Doha, you create uh, technology to cover the streets in order that the people can walk into the streets. In, in, in Chile, you are promoting cars, uh, buses, but not only electrical, but they have USB that is very important for us in our technology. So let's change how the small little things like the USB or huge interventions like covering the, the walking uh, streets is very interesting. Now we are going one step forward. Uh, we are going to jump to another scale where collaboration is the most important thing. For that, we will have, we, we have Mariola and company 
<ríe> Mariola, eh, eh, she's from C40s, the for, C40 Cities. Eh, she manages the C40 Working and Cycle Network, which supports cities to identify, improve, replicate, and accelerate policies and innovation to promote the active mobility. Mariola holds a master, a master in Public Administration by the Columbia University and a Master in Business Administration by ESADE. Mariola, welcome to Barcelona, to your house. <laughs> thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Oscar, for inviting me to participate in uh, this panel, and thank you all for assisting this, to this session. Um, as Oscar mentioned, my name is Mariola Panzuela. I'm part of the Transportation and Urban Planning team at C40 Cities. And today I wanted to share with you C40's efforts to promote cities with uh, more uh, zero uh, emission areas and pedestrian friendly spaces, linking it back also a little bit to the topics that we discussed this morning with Alvaro, with everyone, and, and with Robert. But before I do that, um, just let me tell you a little bit about C40, who we are, what we do, just for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with the organization. Um, C40 is a network of 96 megacities, which together represent 700 million people and about 25% of um, the world's GDP. And despite the fact that obviously these 96 cities are very different among themselves, they all share one common goal, which is fighting climate change. Well, this is, this is a very ugly slide, so I'm not going to cover it all. But the main message that I wanted to convey here is that C40's mission is to support the 96 cities be compliant with the Paris Agreement and keep the temperature rise well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. To do that, C40 uses declarations or commitments. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Green and Healthy Street Declaration to sort of uh, anchor that mission. And we have a broad, um, solid infrastructure of teams and programs to support cities in delivering those declarations aligned with the Paris Agreement. So the Green and Healthy Street Declaration um, has been already been signed by more than 25 cities, including London, Paris, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Tokyo, Barcelona, just to mention a few of them. And basically um, has two commitments. On one side, to procure only zero em emission buses starting in 2025. And on the other, to ensure that a major area of those cities is zero emission by 2030. And I would like to focus a little bit on this second commitment, because I feel like it's not as straightforward as the first one. Why? Because there are many different ways in which cities can implement a zero emission area, which is pedestrian friendly. And I'm pretty sure that none of them will make people happy, at least at the very beginning. And the reason is that public space is a very scarce resource. And when you are giving it to pedestrians, that means that you're going to need to take it away from cars. And people are very attached to their cars. So. Um, we get to a, a point in which uh, when you have to uh, reduce either the car lanes or the on-street parking, people feel like you are taking something away from themselves. But fortunately, evidence and research is on our side and shows that pedestrian-friendly areas, zero emission areas, are not only good for climate, they are also yielding positive economic, social, um, and health uh, benefits. So it's only a matter of time that people realize all the benefits that, that um, these type of interventions have. So just let me show you three ways in which uh, different cities that are signatory of the Green and Healthy Street Declaration are implementing these zero emission areas. I don't know if you have already visited a superblock in the city, but I would definitely encourage to do so if you haven't yet. Uh, superblocks, well, the city of Barcelona takes advantage of their grid structure to basically take these uh, blocks of three by three, pushing car traffic on the fringes of these three by three matrices, and allowing only residents and delivery vans to circulate in within those streets and intersections. 
because the city realized that basically, out of the whole public space, more than 60%, about 65 almost, is occupied by cars, but only 14% of residents use their cars regularly. So in order to address this imbalance, what they are trying to do is basically give back public space to people and repurpose it for social uses, such as uh, making more playgrounds or use parklets, for example. In Paris, uh, the um, Mayor Hidalgo has finally been able to um, pass a, a, a new plan to eliminate car traffic from the right Saints Riverbank. And shutting it down to cars means opening it up to pedestrians and, and to bikers. And finally, City of London, which is also known as the Square Mile, around the bank station, if you know the city, has recently, about two weeks ago, passed a new plan which aims to pedestrianize 50% of this, the streets, uh, reduce slash, I would say, limit, sp uh, um, limit speed to 15 miles per hour, and finally implement two zero emission areas. So I would like to just finalize with uh, the presentation with some thoughts and learnings uh, from uh, the cities that are promoting pedestrian friendly and zero emission areas. The first one is do not travel more, even if that means you know, emitting less. I know that this session is, is called travel more while emitting less, but we actually don't promote more traveling per capita. We promote more, uh, a more equitable travel, but always using transit-oriented development policies that promote cities that are denser, more connected, more compact, and that are articulated around high quality transportation networks. And I think that, again, Barcelona is a great example for that, where in a walking distance, you can find everything you need. If we go to another extreme, maybe we could think about Atlanta, Georgia, in the US, where you have a very differentiated residential area that is miles away from the business area where people have to commute every day, Monday to Friday, which is miles away from the commercial area and malls where people spend the weekends. And that creates a lot of underutilized infrastructure. The second learning is um, reducing car traffic and challenging the status quo is always scary for everyone. So the use of pilots of tactical urbanism techniques to basically uh, test and prototype ideas and concepts and designs and fail fast if you need to, is a way to engage the community and, and create that temporary mindset that sort of brings down a skepticism. I would say that the third learning is, obviously, if you're going to remove cars from the street, you also need to be ready to provide high quality transportation alternatives. Uh, we were discussing earlier before that the landscape of urban transportation modes is becoming richer and more complex. And we think that that's, that's actually a good thing. So be ready to embrace different mobility transportation options, which are sustainable, be they dockless bikes, mobility as a service, electric scooters, etc. And um, finally, use the incentives, positive and negative, at hand to make the right choice of moving around the city, which is basically active mobility, walking, cycling, or transportation, public transportation, the easiest one. I think that that's probably the most important learning that, that these cities have shared with us. And with that, I would like to end. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mariola. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, I would like to know if from the audience, do you have any questions? So you have a micro here. OK. OK, I have two questions here. I would like to, to first highlight also how, how beautiful it sounds to create pedestrian free areas, pedestrian free zones. But here we have three different approaches of how difficult it is. Some cities would like to have an amazing bicycle and uh, cycle infrastructure in our cities, but it's absolutely different. 
we, it's very difficult, uh, I, I would like to know your opinion about pedestrians, so what Mariola says is absolutely necessary from one part of the world with a specific uh, climate. Uh, tell us something more about pedestrians, Ms. Rally, about what's going on in pedestrians besides the technology that you are using, because you have a huge challenge in the streets. Uh, uh, in the region, the Middle East region, I mean, the pedestrian or the walking part, it's really challenging. Usually, it's, you will find it more common in the winter, but in the summer, you will find it really or extremely difficult experience in the afternoon. But uh, in order to, to, to enrich the people or to tell the people to walk more and to travel by car less, I mean, uh, we, ha we are doing like uh, enrichment center to share with the community about uh, the importance of sustainability, the importance of, uh, of health and walking uh, uh, more and uh, traveling less in by car. Uh, it's, um, I, would, I would not say it's easy, but uh, in our case, for example, we are trying as much as possible to make it convenient for the walking, uh, walking friendly, and uh, you will be enjoying while we are, you are walking. I mean, uh, you will be walking in street which is shaded. No tracks will be uh, disturb you. Uh, you. You will feel, uh, you will see a lot of landscape, a lot of water features here and there. And I, th I see that not only us in the in Qatar. I mean, uh, many other uh, projects as well is moving toward that direction. So there is an awareness in the community, and there is uh, a will. That's very interesting. One question that I would think that Mariola could give us some light about it. How do you ensure that citizens are well informed about this development and therefore able to use the facilities to take their full potential? What I think, uh, what I would like to interpret out of this question is, what kind of best examples is using the cities to communicate the changes that is happening? In Santiago, you have a new buses, and it's important that the people feel proud of what they're seeing. What, in your experience, is there any specific uh, strategy from the cities to the citizens to say, hey, we are doing this? Well, definitely community engagement is uh, a key success factor of many pedestrian-friendly areas. As I was mentioning before, there's, there's always that skepticism that uh, sometimes kills even great projects because people feel, feel afraid of change. So. I think that engaging community from the get-go, from the prototyping of these ideas, is absolutely necessary. I think that also, thanks to tactical urbanism techniques, and we are seeing a lot of them in uh, Latin America all over, especially in, in uh, cities like uh, Santiago, is also a way to test these different concepts and on the go make adjustments so city so so residents feel more comfortable and i think that it's throughout this community engagement that also people start feeling ownership of these spaces and that's when you really get that um, mindset uh, shift that you need for a project to be really successful uh, we start we we it's very interesting how from mobility we, we move to participation and I will go to one step back. Um, uh, at the beginning, we, we saw an energy presentation from Tirana. And I would like to know from, Sant from Santiago, uh, what, are the what are the relationships you have with the companies, owners of the, of the buses? Do you have a special agreement with them? Do you, or do you are the owners, or do you promote to buy the bus by the, by the companies? Bueno. Eh, el sistema de transporte público de Santiago en su primera versión partió en el año 2007. Nombro un poco la historia porque es relevante eh, en la reflexión que se está tomando hoy día respecto a cómo queremos avanzar en materia de la relación con los operadores y, y, y en el fondo el, el, la propiedad de los buses. Eh, Esa, esa experiencia nos reportó mucho aprendizaje, fue muy eh, traumática de cierta manera para la ciudadanía, pero también para los operadores y el Estado, porque fue una implementación eh, de Big Ben, o sea, de un día para otro, y eso evidentemente generó un cambio de un sistema a otro en horas. Eh, y dentro de los aprendizajes, eh, porque en esa primera versión el operador que se postulaba tenía que hacer la operación, pero también la adquisición de los buses. 
hoy lo que se está planteando, eh, y es un poco la línea que se está siguiendo para esta renovación de contratos, es separar la operación de la provisión de los buses. <risa> Entra un actor más dentro de la ecuación de, del sistema de transporte público, buscando justamente que en caso, porque eh, lo, que tuvi, lo que nos dice la experiencia es que hubo, hubo opera, operadores que no tuvieron una buena, un buen desempeño. Entonces la idea es que eso, eh, el hecho de separar estos dos negocios, pudiese permitir, y con operadores más pequeños, podría permitir hacer cambios cuando la operación no esté respondiendo a la exigencia tanto eh, de la expectativa del Estado, pero también a la exigencia que el usuario está esperando del sistema. Entonces, ese dinamismo un poco es distinto. Entonces, la relación finalmente es un Estado que establece las condiciones y las reglas del juego eh, y, y se presentan estas empresas tanto como eh, una empresa que provee la, la flota de buses como la operación de la operación. Probably. Probably one of the reflections from here is that uh, systems should be adaptative. I mean, in, you are creating adaptative process or contract process. Uh, you are adapting the needs and you are adapting technology to, 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 your, to, to your needs. Uh, I would like to insist anyone in... Oh, please. Yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mariola, actually. Uh, my name is Janos. I'm, work I'm the ICT manager in the Musheri Smart City Project. So um, previously, in one of the slides, in the beginning of the slides, you mentioned that there was this initiative for the three by three matrices, three blocks in the city. So is this something that is uh, in pa on paper, or is it something that has been implemented uh, right now? And uh, did you find any challenges from the local residents, you know, blocking basically these streets within this, the, the, the matrix uh, for car access. So if you could give some more details and information about this, how was the actual experience when, when trying to implement it? Absolutely. So um, today, if I'm not mistaken, there are already five super blocks in place that you can visit. Um, the, uh, the oldest one, the one that has been in place for a longer time, is in San Martí, uh, in Poplo Nou. And you can see how the, the cities changed uh, that, that area. It's a, that was the first pilot. Uh, it started a few years ago. And uh, it's going through a process of basically, I guess, maturing and making it a permanent infrastructure. Because at the beginning, following tactical urbanism, also principles, what was put in place was um, a little bit of, I would say, almost cheap urban infrastructure, right? Like planters, um, tables, and, and, and chairs, just to see how people were reacted, similar to what New York did in um, Times Square, right, in 2009. The idea is that in the next few years, obviously all these pilots are being evaluated now. I think that there's a report coming out with the results of that evaluation, is that almost the city could be um, uh, could have almost about 40 of those super blocks, which would be totally transformational. And that's a little bit the vision of the city. Obviously, as I said, any type of change creates resistance, and especially when you are taking away space for cars. But I think that people are starting to realize also all the benefits that these projects also come with in terms of health, in terms of having more space for their children and for the elderly to play and, and rest. And, uh, and I think that we are seeing more and more um, neighborhoods interested in having one of those super blocks in their surroundings. So I think all in all, there's obviously many learnings that can be extracted from these pilots, but I think that it's probably an initiative that it's going to continue and hopefully create many more um, of those super blocks in other, in, in other parts of the city. And I would just end up by saying that this is actually a, um, an initiative that, as I said, as part of C40, we are always uh, working in, uh, in network and we are replicating in other cities. So you have London, um, Rotterdam, and um, Athens, sort of also considering their own version of super blocks, which I think it's uh, really interesting and it's a proof that this could work. 
Thank you, Mariona. We are already on time. Uh, I just want to give like a general reflection about it is that change are generate mm, tension in the people. And probably the most challenging thing that we are facing is mobility. And we have here three different examples of how faith cities are facing those, those changes and those tensions. Thank you very much for being here in Barcelona, for being here on the stage. And Robert, thank you very much. Um, so I want to thank Oscar for moderating the session and thank the panel. Um, so please, thanks. Uh, I, I'm just going to close off this session with just a, a few uh, comments to try to connect the dots and see if there's some underlining themes. Uh, we, we had a really rich uh, set of discussions, uh, really providing a global tour of different pathways that are being pursued to uh, advance sustainable mobility, but more specifically, uh, to try to create it's hard to say zero carbon, but certainly less carbon intensive cities through electrification of vehicle fleets, a whole set of urban planning schemes, as well as very um, proactive measures to uh, encourage more pedestrian uh, friendly urban milieus. Um, my takeaway is I, I heard a lot of common uh, terms that were used throughout the morning. Um, uh, there was a really strong emphasis. We heard it certainly in, in the case of, of, of the mayor of, of um, about the importance of leadership and vision. I think this is a field where it, it's critically important we bring a certain amount of passion, a certain amount of inspirational thinking about what's possible. We all recognize there's so many barriers and constraints to doing everything we talk about, trying to limit uh, the, the dependence on the private car and, and advancing alternative modes. And uh, we only begin to really break people out of this sort of, uh, this cynical perspective if, if we do give a sense what's possible, what's plausible. So a very strong important, uh, importance attached to proactivism, lead, leadership, and vision. Um, many of us who work in this field of sustainable mobility, um, we, we hear often this principle of, of the five S's we need to be advancing. And, and we heard all five of these S's uh, in terms of the presentations this morning. One of the S is, is to create cities of short distance travel. That is, um, cities where through compact mixed use transit oriented development, as we heard um, um, Mariella speak to through this uh, C40s initiative, where trip distances are shorter and much more inviting of walking, cycling, and alternative modes. Uh, we need to design more of our transportation networks and invest more of our scarce resources in slower modes, uh, which are enabled by short distance travel. And there we speak to obviously what again are the healthiest, greenest, cleanest modes, walking and cycling. Uh, we get the added benefits of public transport. So slow modes over short distance, I think we recognize is critically important. That said, um, we often, we have to create cities where mobility, uh, most trips are going to be uh, required some kind of mechanized or motorized form of transport, and in so doing, we want this to the degree possible to be low carbon um, forms of mobility. Um, obviously, uh, cycling, but even uh, plug in hybrids or electric buses or anything which has a very small environmental footprint as, as a mode of propulsion. So, clearly, smart. Uh, um, sustainable green forms of mobility is, 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 is key. We also heard, though, the importance of, of um, smart technology, uh, intelligent parking, smart pricing, uh, even things like uh, we heard in Santiago, the, uh, the um, smart tariff system over at the corridor level. Uh, many of the, pre in, in, in the case of Doha, the use of white buildings and, and uh, shading as, as sort of a smart design so uh, smart pricing, smart technologies, I think, plays an important role. And then uh, I, I think as we often uh, ignore, but critically important, we need socially inclusive forms of, of smart mobility. And uh, we heard from um, the example in Albania, the importance of, of designing the city for children, the children's perspective, uh, as well as senior citizens, people who are much more ambulatory restricted and have mobility challenges, but uh, they're part of the game. And clearly, uh, we need to be designing cities where those who are less fortunate than many of us in the room who have uh, fewer, less incomes or disabled or are physically 
uh, challenged in terms of the ability to move about the city uh, that we have alternatives. And that's everything from ensuring we have good green pedestrian infrastructure in those neighborhoods or we have uh, inclusive access to e-bikes and other forms of green mobility. So, um, so this idea of cities of short distance uh, using slower modes and sustainable green propulsion, smart technology, and socially inclusive, I think all of the presentations, we've heard different elements of that. And uh, to many of us, we believe that's very firmly, it's a pathway to begin to nudge us towards this uh, future of low carbon uh, sustainable cities. So with that, again, I want to uh, thank the panel and Oscar and all the speakers as well as our speakers this morning, uh, Avio and Arian, for their delightful presentations. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're all here uh, to discuss any things that you might want to talk about in a little more detail. So again, thank you. And with that, I'll bring this session to a close. Thanks. Thank you.